Anand Ahadi here. Um, gosh, when did we meet? Six, seven years ago? Yeah. Um, she was one of our DBA students, and um, her background is engineering, like most of you. And um, she did an amazing dissertation with Johnson Control on marketing and branding and sustainability. And she just is really passionate and really understands the Blue Ocean strategy and its innovation. And we have stayed in contact since she's graduated. It's Dr. Alhadi, which is nice. Oh, congratulations. And she's with Ford, which is good because we talk a lot about Fiat here. Oh, okay. here, this, this <laughs> side of the room. Okay. I got a GMer. All right. Hello, hey. I'm a supplier to Ford. Supplier to Ford. Um, the government take is it take on or hard act? Take on. Take on. Where are you with Nova? Retail. 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 Yeah. Okay. And these two will be will be back in Washington and Iran. But let's get just a little bit started, a little bit of, maybe a little bit more about your background. But thank you for um, coming here today. It's awesome to, to see you. Sure. She's actually we talk a lot about Porter and Harvard, and so Anand's been to Harvard many times. She did her strategy work. Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Uh, like Dr. Um, Stavros said, I'm, my background is actually in engineering. Um, I'll do a quick, um, very, very quick uh, bio here. Um, I have a bachelor's uh, in industrial engineering from Wayne State, master's in uh, same major. I have another master's in engineering management from Lawrence and a uh, doctorate in uh, business administration. Um, uh, from Lawrence Tech. I recently finished a strategic management graduate program at Harvard and I've been uh, I've worked with the Dean of uh, Extension School on one of my articles well not an article it's really, it's really a research study that I'm planning to submit to Academy of Management Learning and Education. I am interested in the strategy field my uh, dissertation was kind of focused on strategic positioning of triple bottom line, you know, you're familiar with triple bottom line and sustainability. We're going to get to that in chapter nine if you're not, so we'll be, we'll be headed to that. So that's how I kind of transitioned into strategy and, and, uh, and uh, management. Uh, I started at Johnson Controls after I finished my uh, master's degree as a manufacturing engineer, was promoted a couple of times. Now I'm in uh, global manufacturing <coughs> and I also teach in the graduate uh, program at Baker College. I teach strategy courses and uh, in management courses. So that's kind of um, a bit of uh, about me. Uh, today's presentation though is on blue ocean strategy. Okay, How much do you know about blue ocean strategy? Uh, Have you? Only when you practice. And there's only a Earth. paragraph in the book about it. Yeah, the, the assignment for this week. Okay, um, trust me I've met with a lot of CEOs and deans of schools of businesses. Um, a lot more people are not familiar with this, and that's, that's surprising. We'll go over what some of the theories are. Uh, but blue ocean strategy is, in essence, a, a strategy of growth. So in today's agenda, we'll go a little bit over the definition and the concept, uh, let you know who the creators of BOS are. Uh, we'll take a look at blue ocean strategy in practice. I'll give you uh, a list of some suggested readings and uh, just a, a quick overview of what I've done in the um, BLS space. All right, so the creators of uh, Blue Ocean Strategy are Kim Chan and Rene Maborn. They are from INSEAD, uh, out of France. INSEAD, I think, is the second largest business school in the world. Um, Rene was actually Chan's student when they started working on this many, many years ago. The first edition of the book, it was published by Harvard Business School Press. It was, the first edition was published in 2005, and then the second edition is, uh, just came out uh, actually a few months ago, 2015, also published by Harvard Business School. And it's also available like on an audio tape if you're commuting, but it's, it's really a great book to read to understand innovation. <coughs> and it goes back and it talks about the organizations like Ford that was created a blue ocean, but how do you need to keep swimming out into the blue or deep ocean? Yeah, so if you had the opportunity to um, read both books, the main difference between the second edition and the first edition is in the second edition, they try to focus more on the strategy um, execution because it wasn't as um, firm in the first edition. 
So like I mentioned, blue ocean strategy, when you hear blue ocean strategy, essentially it's a strategy of growth, okay? Growth of the business, whether it's through innovation, diversification, it's just really essentially a, a strategy of growth. So the main idea of blue ocean strategy, in the business world, you would either compete or become a pioneer, okay? So blue ocean basically says, instead of competing, create uncontested market space make the competition irrelevant and benefit from first uh, mover advantages and, and uh, uh, innovation advantages. So in, from the perspective of blue ocean strategy, the business world is divided into two spaces, red ocean space and the blue ocean space. Which one is more competitive? Red, red, the idea is competition is fierce, competitors turn the waters red, uh, yep. Bloody, and, and that's how you get the um, red ocean. In blue ocean, there is no competition. The waters are still clear. The uh, opportunity for growth is, is tremendous, and there's really no boundaries. So if we do a quick comparison between <coughs> red ocean and blue ocean, in the red ocean, you are competing in, a, in an existing market space. In blue ocean, it's, um, it's new market space. Uh, here, your goal as a business is to uh, beat the competition. Here, you're just making the competition irrelevant altogether. You're <coughs> exiting the, the competitive market. Here, you are trying to exhaust existing demand. Here, you are actually creating demand. In the red ocean, uh, you make the value cost trade off. Here, you break that value uh, cost trade off. And instead of pursuing either a strategy of differentiation or low cost, and Blue Ocean, you try to do both at the same time. So what does this uh, strategy pivot on? It pivots on value innovation, okay? That's really the, the, the selling point for uh, Blue Ocean. So where you have your buyer value and your cost, where they intersect is the value innovation. And from the creator's perspective, is in order for you to, uh, to create a Blue Ocean of uncontested space, you really need to focus on value innovation, okay? All right, so for Blue Ocean, the creators uh, develop four principles for formulation and then four principles to execute the strategy. With any strategy, you have to formulate it first and then you have to execute it. From my experience, from the industry experience and my research experience, I think the most important principle in the formulation is this one here, restructuring market boundaries. Actually, if we look at all the examples from, <coughs> from various industries, they really stem from reconstruction of market boundaries. Uh, Ma Bourne and, and Chan Kim also say, focus on the big picture and as you pursue uncontested market spaces, and then reach beyond existing demand and obviously uh, follow the right sequence. But I do want to focus on this reconstruction of market boundaries. So they suggest that as you do this, you need to look across multiple things, not necessarily at the same time. So look across alternative industries and look for new ideas, innovative ideas. Look across strategic groups within an industry. What is a strategic, uh, a number of strategic groups within an industry? Give me an example. Marketing. Okay, and pick an industry. R&D. Uh, in industries, oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. functional yeah. group within an industry. Automotive, an automotive industry. Pick few uh, strategic groups. Uh, as in providers for marketing, you say? Uh, OEMs. Oh, so yeah, so we have the luxury group. Ah, okay. Right? Segments. Got it. Uh, they call them, um, they're, they're strategically grouped together. Okay. Not sure. necessarily. Think, yeah. of the, think of the um, strategic group maps we did, which was in chapter three. Yeah. That's what she's talking yeah. about. Yeah. So, for example, in the automotive industry, you have the luxury strategic group that has Mercedes, BM, Maybach. You have the economy strategic group has the uh, cost effective vehicles. In the fashion industry, you would have your upper scale fashion designers, uh, uh, Chris and Dior, Brooks Brothers, and then you have your low cost. So in each industry, there's a strategic group. So what they're suggesting is 
look across those strategic groups and try to extract elements from each group and integrate them into a new innovative idea. Okay, we'll go through some of those examples later. They also suggest looking across uh, your chain of supply. Who supplies what? Can you have another supplier supply another piece? And you can, you can extract, again, elements um, to develop an innovative idea, ideas. You, they also suggest um, reconstructing marking, mark, market boundaries by looking across complementary products and services. Okay? We are going to look at the Prius and some of those uh, very famous examples. Uh, also look across functional and emotional appeal of buyers and look across time. So these six domains, if you look across the iconic elements, you can extract some of those and integrate them into an innovative idea. And then the four principles of execution is, is obviously overcoming the organizational hurdles. Who do you think are some of the common organizational roadblock when it gets to innovation, typically? Fine. Fine. <laughs> they are focused on short-term gains. So usually with, with innovation, there's a lot of brainstorming. There's a lot of expenses in R&D. Sometimes the stuff works, sometimes it doesn't. So finance is usually um, a roadblock for the financial organization. Uh, you have also to build execution into strategy. It, from the research that I've done, lotion strategy is, still needs some work in the execution, and that was some of the criticism for the, uh, uh, for the um, uh, strategy. And then, obviously, as you execute strategy, blue ocean strategy, you need to focus on the value, the profit, and people simultaneously, and that's not really nothing new. And then the newest, one of the newest elements in the second edition is, is here. This is the renewal of the blue oceans. So the idea is once you've created a, um, a blue ocean of uncontested space, don't stop there and try to continue um, creating those blue oceans. All right, so in practice, who is actually talking about blue ocean strategy? If you do some research in the uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, the website is actually an excellent source. You have a, a, a good balance of disciplines and functions. You've got entrepreneurs, you've got government officials, automotive um, uh, key players, you have people in the technology, logistics. So what this says is that Blue Ocean conceptually can be applied anywhere. Okay. The idea itself isn't new, okay? Because it, it's really about innovation. It's really about creating something new, okay? And becoming a pioneer. This way you make the, the competition irrelevant. If you look at uh, famous innovation works like uh, Clayton Christensen's at Harvard, he came up with um, disruptive innovation. We have uh, Mark Heitz in the London School of Business. He came up with strategic innovation. All of those things, when you, when you do the research, they are very similar to Blue Ocean Strategy. Mark Hyde's article was published in the Sloan Management Review in 1997. And when you read the article, it's basically what Blue Ocean Strategy is talking about. So, so the idea is not, is not really new. It's the amount of effort and work that the two authors put together to, in order to further develop it. Uh, in one of my meetings, and I'm not going to mention the name, uh, with one of the big, big business school deans, he said Blue Ocean is just old wine in a new bottle. Which is honestly, it, it, it is the same with some of the most famous pieces in the, in the literature. Uh, Porter's work, you're familiar with Porter, Harvard? Five forces, competitive forces that shape strategy. His work actually <laughs> originated, I think, from Drucker in the 1930s or 40s. Yeah, so, so Blue Ocean Strategy is not necessarily really new because it really talks about innovation, but it's, it's, the, it's the structure and the discipline that the authors put into it to make it a, um, uh, an actual strategy that can be implemented. Now, uh, I do want to also talk to you about um, some, of the, some of the 
the talk that's happening in the, in the literature. So if you do research, you're going to notice that Blue Ocean Strategy isn't as famous, isn't as popular as like Christensen's work and Porter's work. And there are some theories, and those theories also from um, deans of very big uh, business schools. One of them is maybe because they're really not at Harvard or at Stanford, they're from INSEAD. If this work has originated you know, at Harvard or Stanford, it would probably have been a lot more popular. So it's, that's one thing. But I would argue, it says over 2 million copies sold. It is a popular press book, whereas taken off, I think, is in the business people. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's, that's why I think they're doing so well with it, is because of the popular press. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they really, um, it, it's, it's, I was surprised when I've, I've not talked to several CEOs when I was doing uh, my research. I was surprised and kind of shocked that a lot of them really don't know about Blue Ocean Strategy. But when I mentioned, well, it, it talks about innovation, then, it, they, then the, the strategy starts to make sense to them. Um, all right, in practice. So when you read the book, some of the examples are repeated several times. Um, I know the Surf de Salule is uh, one of the famous examples. The Teoda uh, Prius is one. So when you look at Teoda Prius, when we go back to the restructuring of market boundaries, what was the approach with the Prius? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean if you talk to the Teoda officials, they will tell you, oh, we've implemented a blue ocean strategy. That's not, gonna, that, that's not the case. But when you look at the final product, it is an example of creating blue ocean strategy in what way? OK, what, what did they do? Relatively um, good cost uh, for the high quality yep. cost. So when we look at the restructuring of market boundaries, okay, and we said when you when you do that, you need to look across alternative industries. You need to look across strategic groups within uh, um, within an industry. The Prius actually kind of integrated elements from the automotive industry, obviously, energy industry, right? with the um, hybrid technology. Uh, Ralph Lauren, fashion industry, they created, they definitely created blue space. How? Actually, it's a combination of luxury goods. So take, for example, Brooks Brothers, and affordable clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more. Yeah, I think they've, they've, they, they've overexposed the brand. Uh, they'll feel the pain in, in a couple of years. But that's, ha but that's how it originated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Body Shop definitely created Blue Ocean. How? What's, what's unique about the Body Shop? Well, if we look at this. So Body Shop is all about being green and recycling. And if you uh, bring us back your uh, empty bottles, you get free refills. And we're really green. And so, so they really, they did this. They tapped into the functional and emotional appeal of buyers. And you see Body Shops in a lot of companies. You don't see, what's that place, Bed Bath? Bed Bath and Beyond. You don't see, okay. Bath and Body Shop. But, Uh, not jets. Are you familiar with not jets? Not jets not, is. Not high up, high up. You will be when you become a C level manager. You will be. You're probably going to be a customer. But what not jets? What they do is they they lease private jets for C level managers. Okay. So before not jets, not jets was actually a pioneer in this space. But before not jet, if you wanted a private jet, you you go buy it. Right. Here. Um, what they what they've combined is they combined uh, private airlines or um, with uh, affordable transportation elements, and they came out with not jets. You could actually lease it, and it, they're very very successful. Apple. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> Apple. I just read an article on the Harvard Business Review. It's, 
Apple did everything. Apple did competitive strategy, disruptive innovation, strategic innovation, blue ocean strategy. And my article that I'm working on, I'm, I'm really urging the, the public to stop talking about Apple because there are other successful organizations, but we'll talk about that it's later. It's iconic, literally. It's, it's, yeah, it's very iconic, but. <laughs> All right. So definitely take some time and look at their website. There is wealth of information about Blue Ocean Strategy. And what's kind of cool about this website is they not only uh, go in, uh, into detail about the work, but they also publish anything that was published about Blue Ocean. Okay, So that's great. And it gives you examples of, of who's talking about uh, Blue Ocean Strategy and in what context. So definitely look at the website. The next two slides are <laughs> Some uh, list of suggested readings. When you look at how many, how many of you are actually doing research? Okay. When um, and and hopefully you you do a lot more research in the near future. Uh, one of the things that you notice that if you look at the Academy of Management, unfortunately, you will not see articles or published studies about blue ocean strategy. You know, there's a lot of politics in publishing. But there's there's definitely not not a significant amount of yeah California Management Review Harvard Business Review they publish uh, a quite number of, of articles most of the articles that are published in the Harvard Business Review about Blue Ocean Strategy were actually um, uh, they were actually um, uh, published by the authors. Okay, and that's um, and that's that's something you're also going to notice. Now they do um, the, the, in the literature they, they say that blue ocean strategy. Now we know that blue ocean strategy is, is out of INSEAD in France, right? And it basically, without mentioning the name Porter, it really it competes head to head with Porter's five forces. Okay, because Porter basically says it's all about the competition, and here's a framework to compete fiercely in the industry. This says, forget about all of that and let's just create. So they do, they do um, do some um, um, clashing un unannounced in, uh, uh, in, their, in their book. And this is another, this is uh, also some suggested readings. In terms of what I've done in the BOS space, this is one of my earliest studies that I published, I think, in the Journal of Strategy and Management. Uh, I've looked, I was interested in the sustainability space, and that's kind of, I transitioned from my dissertation into, into sustainable value by Laszlo. And I've looked at innovative value um, from the blue ocean strategy, and I thought, you know what, it's really all about the value, whether we want this value to be innovative or sustainable. If we just focus on the value, and we, can, we know we can find value in everything, in the process, in the service, in every phase of your design or um, uh, of your cycle, you will find innovation. And it, it's really, this is the cornerstone. Okay, if you focus on innovation, you will tap into sustainability and you will also tap into uh, blue ocean. Um, some of the pieces that I've written about blue <coughs> ocean strategy, my most recent one, and, and it's, it's near complete, it's, uh, it's a working paper. And I do talk about the basics of growth. Um, are you uh, familiar with Asloff's matrix? That a business can only it's uh, a business can only grow through uh, diversification, uh, market development, market penetration, or product development. It's really however you however you look at it, the business will grow in one of these four ways. And and this piece is really about. Um, suggesting that all these emerging strategies about uh, the conceptual frameworks about strategies, disruption, uh, disruptive innovation, strategic innovation, blue ocean, competitive forces, they really funnel through Oslov's matrix. They, they really, they, a lot of them overlap. And it's at the end of the day, I think what, what, what's really key is to do what's best for the company. But whatever you choose, whatever you select, you have to do it well. 
And in this article, I actually look at um, the most uh, profitable companies in the world for 2015 and the most innovative ones. And I've looked at the sources of innovation in all of them, and I'm trying to see, I mean, who did what? We know so that. Who are the top ones for 2015? Profitable or innovative? Both. Profitable. <coughs> um, are you familiar with um, uh, Van Phone? It's a, it's a telecommunication company out of Britain. It's actually, um, I think it owns T-Mobile, Verizon, and, okay. This company made $90 billion in profit. Profit, not revenue. Okay. okay. Uh, we've got the three banks of China, the <coughs> agricultural bank, the commercial bank, no, really. Between. That's a little biased. <laughs> That's a but they, they, they make billions and billions of profit. So those are some of the uh, most profitable companies. When I uh, cross-reference the list, because I wanted to see if the most innovative companies are, would even show on the most profitable companies, I actually, um, my, the, the list went down to about 10. And Apple was one of them, Samsung. Um, Google. Uh, Google was not. Wow. Yeah, no, it was not. Amazon is innovative, but they are not profitable. No, they're not. Um, who else was on the list? Uh, I've got Samsung, uh, Apple, and, and a couple of, I can't, I can't think of them right now, but, uh, but yeah, you will see a lot in the automotive industry, since many of you are in automotive, some of the most profitable um, automotive companies that showed on the list were, um, can't think, no. Uh, yeah, and no, and they were they were on the one of the most uh, they were on the most profitable companies. Um, I know BMW was on the most profitable, uh, no, the most innovative. Toyota was on both lists. Most innovative. Toyota is actually the only automotive uh, company that was on both lists. So that really puts things in, in perspective. They also are on, uh, Toyota is also on uh, uh, Boston Consulting Group, which is a, a, a tier one co consulting group, and they publish the most innovative uh, companies and the most steadily innovative companies. So companies that were successful in the innovation space for about a year or two won't be on the list, but companies that were for the past seven consecutive years they are, will be, Toyota was one of them. So Toyota is doing great things, and they have been doing great things consistently. And I think there's wealth of stuff we can learn from Toyota. And then uh, a couple of uh, um, pieces and uh, sorry, presentations that I've done. So that's, that's really what I wanted to cover with you with respect to uh, Blue Ocean strategy. So what do you think? You're somebody that really understands theory and the research. So when you talked about, when you first started Blue Ocean, you talked about cost and, and innovation. Now, were you suggesting that you got you still have to hold your cost down when you're in that Blue Ocean? Or is that a common mistake that we try to get so much margin because we're brand new in this new space and it's, we're the only people out there? Is that, uh, which part were you angling at when you talked so, about cost? So the creators of uh, Blue Ocean, they really focus on both at the same time. But so the idea... Isn't that your opportunity to take as much margin as you can well, get? Well, are point? you talking about controlling your cost? But I can still sell for a premium, right? This is true. Okay, so it was on the uh, so it was true right. cost yeah. Yeah. versus yeah. red yeah. Uh, Maybe I missed the call. No, well, no yeah. I, okay. I, I know what you're saying, and it did look like you can't be a, a low cost like Walmart out there and differentiate because you can, if you can go out there in a blue ocean. You can have low cost internally and control your cost. I mean, you can charge a premium price if you're sure. on the first and, and be a, have a very focused differentiation but is, strategy. But is that, the stra is that a, an appropriate strategy or is that a, a big mistake? I think a blue ocean can end up in any five of those categories. So let's go yeah. one step further with profitability and innovation, right? So not most, like you just alluded to, that most companies that are on a profitability 
spectrum are not in an innovative they're not. spectrum, right? So it's the, the two are totally negatively correlated. I'm not sure if they're totally negative. Uh, correlated. To, to a percentage, right? They're, they're down to a finite percentage of, of correlation. And maybe only that's just for right now. I don't well, see innovation in a product in this a year, right? I don't know if the duration is, you know, met for a year. No. It's all economy based too, right? You yeah, and then, buyers for those innovative goods. and then at the end of the day, Blue Ocean strategy is a strategy, right? <laughs> and it promotes for the growth of the business in the long term. Right. The, so the, it's, the, the, my takeaway from this is that's really important <laughs> is to uh, look at several different uh, innovators and then find out that nugget, that gold nugget of what that is, and then create something new. That's very interesting. Yeah, and do, you know, do you know exactly, I don't know quite how to say this or explain it, but after I've looked at five or six individuals doing something in the creativity field, I could take the, I'm actually stealing their stuff, basically. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking their ideas and innovations and creating something else. N not necessarily what other people have done. No, not necessarily. So when we, when we look, for example, when we go back to the reconstruction of market boundaries, when you look at cross industries, okay, it's not really taking, extracting elements from things that other people have done. But look at the um, iconic elements in that industry and maybe integrate some of those. So no, not necessarily, oh, I'm gonna look at what Apple did you know, with this feature or with this app, I'll take it and I will take what Samsung did with, with this TV and I integrate them together, not necessarily. Yeah, you just look at elements, iconic well, elements. The guy that uh, I was reading about today, that, I forgot his name, that started uh, Amazon. He's yeah. where he looked at the research of um, how fast the online shopping was growing and then probably matched that with the technology, how uh, technology, meaning computers, are more and more people's homes, and saw that curve and decided to do something about it. Yeah, and and yeah, and he integrated elements from um, from technology, right, and from you know shopping, and developed Amazon. So let me ask you a question. So you have <coughs> strategic group maps, and we've learned about in the course where you take two factors and you put your competition and yourself out there. So to create a blue ocean, do you actually leave the strategic group map, or do you go to a place on the strategic group map where, the, where there is nobody? Well, according to, to the creators, uh, leave that space. That's what I'm thinking is you create a new strategic map. You know, it's not a group map right. until the competition comes out. Right. Yeah. But you create the demand, so hopefully. Well, yeah, hopefully so that's the, yeah, the idea is you, you create demand, you do benefit from first mover um, advantages, but then if you could. So in your opinion, I won't use Apple as the, as the guinea pig here, but in the, in the cell phone industry, who do you see as being the first one to implement a buyback program for hardware? Meaning, so the innovation of buying back so that people don't have to continually buy, they can go in, trade in, trade up. Yeah. There's no one out there right now that has that. Yeah. To, a, to, a, to, sure? a, to a percentage, right? Like Apple, they will not buy back an iPhone, period. They'll give you money towards it, like a hundred bucks worth, but there's no value in, in the cost of, of recycled goods. They haven't found a, a value yet. They haven't found a buyer for recycled iPhones, iPhone fours, iPhone fives. You can go on any online store, right? Like buy back my phone or whatever, and sell it, and they'll they'll sell it for something. Else. So I'm just wondering who's going to give you dollar for dollar cost? Well, I think it's going to be your company, Bobby. <laughs> That's Probably. great. Register, you know, that's just one idea. Bobby, buy <laughs> Now you were talking about this profitability companies, right? Uh -huh. On how much profit they were you were making. But that was for just one year. Is that year after year? Did you look at that you know, for multiple years? Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking Apple should be up to the top sell more because they're making like year after year like billions of dollars of profit. Right. And they, they grew you know, like crazy in the last 10 years. So. so yes, and definitely I can look at prior years, but the, the, the assumption or the educated hunch is that if you've made $50 billion a year in profit this year, it, it, it did not happen overnight. You must have been profitable you know, the years before. But with, with respect to my research, I'm not, 
at least uh, in that article, I'm not really interested in the profitability element as much as the innovation part. So the thing with innovation is that you could, you, if you're a startup company, you could be innovative for about a year, but then if you lose market share, then that innovation really doesn't count for much. You have to be a steadily innovator. So if you consistently are an uh, innovator, then we look at your profitability and, and see if you actually would show up on both lists because there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of research um, that shows that profitability is positively associated with innovation. But then as we talk about innovation as you know, our, this ultimate strategy of, of growth, are innovative companies really super profitable? Or are they, or is the source of their profitability is from other areas, not innovation? Maybe innovation gives them a competitive edge to build reputational capacity or reputational capital, but that's really not the source of their profitability. So what is the innovation truly attributed to so, perspective? So what attracted me to have Nan come and talk to you is she's really trying to understand the blue ocean of blue ocean strategy. And this is why they had to write another book. I've, I've read Blue Ocean a couple of times. And uh -huh. the blue ocean of the blue ocean is that it's a great conversation. We need a blue ocean strategy. But nobody really knows how to do it well. They make it a little bit complicated in the book. It's kind of surfacy. But the key is, if you can create a blue ocean, that's pretty awesome. And so I'm, I'm very interested. The second book just came out in looking at it because First book doesn't talk like, well, how do you do it? So you tell me around. Well, well, but, how it's to. Great, right. but it's a great comp. Well, don't you all want a blue ocean strategy? Absolutely. For your company? Would, you, would you consider the Dutch healthcare uh, engine to be a blue ocean since we are the only we have the only vehicles that have like 700 horsepower? Mm -hmm. Stock! Well, uh, <laughs> at low cost. No, I said I don't think that's. Sorry, go ahead. A low cost, right? Cost. Here's the thing, the blue ocean well, can fall into any of your Ferraris. five generic strategies. Fly, the key in the blue, blue ocean is nobody's here but us, right? And I, I we are me. making, the blue oceans the book talks about, not only are they innovative, but they are profitable and they're creating something out there. But the question is how long can you sustain it? Yeah, and another... <laughs> well, eventually the catch up so to you, right? And that's, and that's why the element they, they really focused on, they tried to focus on in the second edition is how to renew the blue oceans. Um, the, the one thing that I'm, that I'm interested really in, in continuing my research in is how does this blue ocean strategy play in mature industries? Is it really even feasible to continue to innovate? I think that's what I was just going to say. It depends on what the definition of innovation becomes or evolves to. That, that's one of my questions I was going to ask. Do you find when you consult with companies that haven't done this and try to help them to try to do it, do they start out sometimes by limiting themselves by thinking, yeah, I want a wide open space, but they, do they ever, do they bring themselves back to, well, let's think about the resources we have and it'll take and that, that strategy might be too far out. We don't have the resources. Yes. Yeah. They do. If, if, Innovation is, is being planned correctly. You can't just go in and innovate. You really have to make a, a business case for innovation. You have to look at what you're trying to innovate, forecast the market for, and obviously factor in your cost. <coughs> if it's good for you, the idea is you're going to proceed. If it's not, no. Now, one of the reasons for the success of Toyota is they do innovate strategically, and they take their time. It's a long-term strategy. I was just going to say, I haven't seen an innovative product in a little while, like since I've been born. <laughs> well, you only want to I'm 25, but who's coming? Well, but look at, no, but right. look, at this, it, look at the innovation that, they've, that, they, um, that they did. It, it has not been done better than Toyota. And Toyota is known for that. They will really strategically innovate. They're not going to... You were born after oh, before two thousand, right? <laughs> so I guess what is what, again? It gets back to what's the scope of innovative, right? The Prius wasn't the first. Being a, a five five S Kaizen company is 
is the goal of innovation, then yeah, sure, they are the five mass champions. They are the kings in the industry of Kaizen, period. Kanban, Kaizen, you name it. They created it. It's the Toyota system. You know, but I guess with regard to innovative products, they're, they're not producing an innovative product. I mean, their cars are not visually attractive whatsoever. Uh, they're, are they sustainable? Perhaps, yes. They have high mileage capabilities, but battery power, sure. But they're not. Well, I won't argue with that. You work in the industry. I guess, that's what I'm getting at. It's, it's a very the broad definition of innovative, right? It is. It is. And it's. Yeah, what end customers, what we, um, and that's one of the things that I, that I focus on in my piece is, and I've just met with actually the, um, the head of uh, global strategy at Ford, Kassessa. When we talk about innovation, it really, it, we, we need to stop thinking, uh, on focusing on the product as end customers. You could innovate in the thought process. Okay, you could, you could innovate, there is space for innovation. Yeah, don't just look at the, at the final product. The final product is the easily actually seen um, reflection of innovation. But in order to guarantee or, or in order to plan for long-term success, the innovation has to be built into everything that you do. That's, 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 what, I, that's what I think. Um, Toyota, like you said, and when I look at the Toyota vehicle, there's really mm, it's what they what they offer. The features, highly reliable, excellent quality. But when you think of the innovation part, they really they you know they haven't really come out with something you know. But there's the innovation is built into their process, and they're yeah, and and they're just seven over seven, I guess, right? Seven years of sustainable profit and growth. What else? I can't thank you enough because here's what the textbook says. It gives one paragraph and it says a blue ocean market space is where the industry has not yet taken shape with no rivals and wide open long term profit or with no rivals and that you want to look at a wide open long term profit and potential for a firm that can create a demand for even the book talks about it, a new type of product. So by bringing in Hana today, I knew she would get me on the textbook jargon and really tell you what's going on in her research here. And I think one of the golden nuggets is what you just said, is innovation, you don't wait till it gets out to the consumer. Where are you innovating? What are you doing differently along your, your value chain? And then really when, when we're in the industry, any industry, we have to look at all these strategies with you know, a grain of salt. It, Competitive strategy is a great strategy, but should I only focus on competitive strategy? Should I only focus on disruptive innovation? The answer should be no, right? Because it really depends on the market, market conditions, state of the economy, your organizational, your, your organizational structure, the size of your organization, all of these factors you have to, sometimes it's not, it's not very valuable for you to innovate. So, you know, steer companies. There's, if there's no room for the industry to innovate, especially in the final product, I mean, is it, is it okay to do business as usual for a couple of years maybe until an opportunity presents itself for innovation? If a company is really keen on innovation, I just want to be an innovative, uh, an, an, an innovator. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good strategy, but do it when it's, when it's most feasible for you to formulate and to execute. Sometimes disruptive strategy, if it's, n if it's not done correctly, it's, it's not, it's really a strategy for failure. Well, and, and I want to point out, you know, we use this different, a little bit different textbook here than we've ever used in the underground with the articles in the back, but if you go to today's reading about organizational and ambidextry, balancing strategic innovation, That's competitive strategy, it's all they're talking about, blue ocean, these guys here. It's mixing all the strategies um, you just mentioned. But every, yeah, it's, everything is, Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean, and Blue Ocean is first mover, but everything on these two pages is just really enough important because what I'm not saying is what organizational ambidextrous is. So this is a really good article. It's mm -hmm. not as long as the Blue Ocean article, but it's really good. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions?
a feel for the best, the most innovative companies, is that more of an organic thing that, that grows in the company, or is that something where, in our company, for example, you'll get these these initiatives that are kind of forced, these are our goals this year, we're gonna have two innovative ideas by the end of the year, and if we don't get it, we failed. Do you see that? I mean, do you no, it should be. It should be in the DNA. Now, the Ford is really trying to, to integrate innovation into its DNA. So Christensen um, talks about the innovator DNA. And uh, Porter, a few years back, talked about innovation capacity. So it's, it's not, it's not a, something that you can slap on a, a product. Or it's, it's supposed to be integrated into the culture. It's supposed to be really your way of, of doing things. It's, it, it will have to be. In order for it to be successful, it's going to have to be. Otherwise, it will end up being like sustainability. If an organization isn't really truly sustainable, if the sustainability isn't in its DNA or in its fabric as an organization, it's just going to be a, a, um, a fad. Yeah, uh, just something they just slap on this financial year where we're going to be sustainable. But if yeah, you'll just continue to pay for it. It won't be a true, like you said, on the DNA driven. How, how, do you, how does the senior leadership, I mean, do you see them having the patience for that type of, of a culture <coughs> change? If it uh, doesn't happen in a year or two in our, our organization. It doesn't. It, it just dies. <coughs> Why do you think nobody else is modeled the TPS? Nobody can touch it. They can't try and take it. They're talking about production. They yeah. just, and nobody can. There's not a single other way that's been successful. Well, I found that when we try to implement a Toyota production system, we like to cherry pick what we think yes. is the cool parts of it and make it the Chrysler, you know, back in the day it was Chrysler. Um, CCS. CCS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. But we don't, we don't want to understand <laughs> where it came from and how they got there. We just want to pick the pieces that look good to us and just implement that. And then we sit back and go, why didn't it work? Why didn't we get the game? But because she said economy and whatever. Well, so I mean, when the economy's up with the Clinton administration, no, a lot of things just you know took off themselves. No matter what you did, if you did things right, you did some things wrong. Regardless, it didn't show up in your profit line, expensive. and things were good. Nobody cared. They didn't look at these blue ocean strategies and whatnot. We were just working, and everything took care of itself. It's when it's the economy's bad, things go awry. No matter what you do, again. You do the right things and do things right or whatever, no strategy. But works. Blue Ocean would probably say the economy is irrelevant. That's exactly right. And your competition is irrelevant. We, although now we're looking at the bottom line, though, realistically, it's always about the money, right? So, but I mean, Blue when the economy Ocean's is great. Blue strategies have been able to succeed when, it, when the economy has to change. You know the example I showed you, that global company I worked with? I forgot to tell you, that's when the economy was tanking. And Detroit was tanking. And so the executive director said, I know. Detroit's going down, the economy. It's, it's, I started working with them in <coughs> 2000, I want to say, um, seven or eight. It's the worst economy we had. But they didn't pay attention to the economy. He says, I'm going to show you that even though Detroit could go down, this is before the automotive um, government stepped in, that we can go to the top no matter how bad the economy Just is. Four. So that was a perfect example. He said they've been seven years now on the most seven so look at that. Count seven years back. Well, Why? Just for us, for automotive. I'm just saying. But uh, this other company I showed is not automotive. It was a it's a financial technology service firm that profited and had an innovation in the worst economy in the sure. country, That's let alone what happened to Detroit. Morgan Stanley made a profit in 2008, right? Yeah. When everybody oh, spread all because at the end of the day, when you when you think of innovation as a strategy, wh what is the ultimate purpose of innovation really? Growth, growth. You're, you're, it's not a survival strategy. You're, you're not innovating to survive. You're actually innovating to create demand and to be a pioneer and and to grow. So if you do it the right way, even in in in, in recessions and economic downturn turns, it's, it is a growth strategy. So ideally you will continue to grow. But then if you, obviously, if it's not integrated in the culture and if it's not in the way you do business, then uh, it becomes it, it becomes a not a very valuable, I guess, strategy. And that touches read, on. If you have a read Article 11, because everything you're saying is, is its last four points, the four archetypes, archetypes of strategic innovation is everything you guys are talking about right here. So her point, you can't, if, if like my view of innovation was focusing on the product, if all if Toyota would have only focused on the product during the last seven years, they would not be on that, that, 
that list. And then think of other things that Toyota did during the recession. Um, you are aware that all most plants and any, any OEM plant that could lay off folks, they laid them off, except for Toyota. Did not lay off, no, not that you did not have to. Da production was extremely down. Sure. They kept the employees. What did the employees do? They kept them working. They did 5S. They laid off zero, zero employees. Okay, so when they actually brought one of the executive director, he was a new hire to Toyota, and in uh, one of the executive meetings, they said, we're not going to lay off anyone. So to him, that was, uh, uh, a, it, it blew his mind. How do you not lay off people when production is down? He said, the, um, the Toyota COE, North America, uh, America, said if we don't lay off people today, production will go up, and then we won't lay them off tomorrow. So tomorrow is just, you know, the future of today, so we keep them. And, and, and think, of, think of, you know, customer loyalty, employee retention, and, you know, all of these things that you, and that was innovative, really Never huge. Yeah, no, but that's, the yeah, Toyota lays off no people. And on 9-11, Southwest Airlines and British Airways were the only two airlines that didn't lay off when that happened. They were shut down all their Right. And if you look at, um, British Airways, they're talked about a blue ocean strategy. And how they found, you know, now they got to stay ahead to stay um, innovative, but they were the two airlines that didn't, they could have taken advantage of a horrible situation and did what the rest of the airlines did, and they didn't. So innovation actually spans multiple aspects. It's not just the final product. That was probably the biggest learning point for me tonight. Exactly. You know, you, but you think about the end product. It's perception. It's not, it's not accurate whatsoever. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anand, for being here. Great thank discussion, you, you guys. Um, it is 8 o'clock, so you guys use the next maybe 20, 25 minutes for team time. I'm not going anywhere. I just want to say goodbye to Anand, and you can um, you know, a little, little present for you. Because I do flowers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank